Oh my god, pink dogs and Louis the 15th jackets are so out. This season in Pan Am is all about archery, white roses, and child slaughter. Oh, and blue hair. Oh, it's so cute. <laughs> Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, where we salute the Capitol for enacting the law that, frankly, all of us want to see passed Halloween every day. Unfortunately, today we're not talking about the Capitol's choice in coiffery, or even any of their super high-tech equipment. Battle tactics, political strategy... Jeez, there's a lot of topics that we could take on here. No, today we're talking about their most memorable catchphrase. May the odds, May the odds, May the odds be ever... Be ever... Be ever May the odds be ever in your favor. May the odds be ever in your favor. It's a throwaway line that every on-screen character from the Capitol tosses out before the tributes are chosen, during their press tour, even as they're walking into the games. Hunger Games fans use it at the movies, while reading the books, in line for the iPhone 6. It's everywhere. The characters in the Capitol use it like a way of saying good luck to the tributes, but in reality, odds have nothing to do with luck. They have to do with math. And it turns out the biggest secret of the Hunger Games is that this phrase isn't telling you to break a leg, it's telling you how to survive the games. Believe it or not, you can control whether the odds are ever in your favor. You can turn the games into anything but a matter of luck. Whether you're the sole survivor or dead on the first day depends precisely on whether you've made those odds in your favor. And after today's episode, you'll know how to win the Hunger Games, not by skill or strength or extremely advanced finger painting skills, but through the power of probability. Choose wisely and you have the best best possible chances of surviving. It's like Moneyball, except instead of money, you're betting your life and the lives of 23 other innocent children. As you can tell, this is gonna be a really feel-good episode. Okay, so say you wanna survive the Hunger Games. Step one that ensures that you live 100% of the time. I volunteer as tribute. Don't volunteer when your name isn't drawn. Odds are you survive every time. But okay, say you want to be a hero and you've just volunteered as tribute. Stupid decision, but since you're here, you need to move quickly. When you start the games, there are 24 total tributes, two from each district. As such, your starting odds for winning the Hunger Games are 1 in 24, which aren't going to get you very far. And I can already see you going into the comments in protest because it's definitely arguable that even from the very beginning, not all tributes are created equally. Rue doesn't have the same probability of winning as, say, Katniss, or a career, or Foxface. To that I say, wrong. In articles already published about the Hunger Games, it's been shown statistically that your odds of winning are actually equal no matter what your race, age, gender, or district. Based on the information available on past winners, it turns out that those factors actually don't impact your likelihood of survival. Winners come from both genders, race and color certainly don't seem to be a big factor in Pan Am, and the age ranges of the winning trip tributes are definitely variable, making your starting characteristics in the Hunger Games a statistical wash. Say what you will about the fascism and gamified child slaughter, the Hunger Games aren't prejudiced. Even the careers, those kids trained from an early age to be sociopathic killers with the express purpose of surviving the games, who you would think have a higher probability of winning, actually don't. The math doesn't lie. So hey, that's great news for you if you're coming from one of the poorer districts. And if you're a career, well, sorry, you just wasted your life. All right, so knowing that, you've arrived in the capital, fresh off the train as a new tribute. What are you gonna do? Cry and contemplate the sweet release of death? Ha! Huh, heck no! Mistake number one that tributes make is wasting this precious time. If you want to stack the odds ever in your favor, you do it before you're locked in the tube and the game's countdown begins. This isn't make out with PETA hour or write sappy letter home time. You have one week, seven days in the capital to pre-game. And pre-game hard. No, not that kind of pre-gaming. The pre-Hunger Games pre-gaming involves two things, training and eating. To give yourself the best statistical advantage going into the arena, you start by carbo loading. No, really, it sounds stupid, but this isn't the time to work on your thigh gap for your capital approved yoga tights. This is the time to put on the old LBSs. Just think of it like Thanksgiving, except it's I'll be thanking myself next week when all my friends are dead. But seriously, think about it. 
sense. You don't know what type of arena you're entering, but one thing you do know from past games is there might not be any food for weeks. And you, as an active adolescent fighting for your life, are going to be burning 2,000 to 2,400 calories a day depending on your gender. Under the stress of fighting off jabber jays and bad CGI dogs, we can assume that you're going to be burning far more than that, meaning that you want to have some body mass to spare. As such, you significantly increase your odds of survival by putting on 5 pounds of fat leading up to the games. This gives you an extra 17,500 extra calories to survive on, or 8.5 days before your body starts shutting down from starvation, which honestly may be enough to get you most of the way there. The Hunger Games isn't always the same length, but we know the 74th game in movie 1 was 18 days long, meaning that technically you could survive almost half that time on practically nothing. In that same Hunger Games, 11 out of the 24 tributes died while trying to grab supplies and food. So from a probability standpoint, being able to survive independently significantly ups your chances in the long run. So great, you're feasting up a storm. Our next step is to make sure that you're using your training time well. You've got three days here in the gym, and let's face it, you're not going to be building any new weapon skills from scratch. So don't bother trying to become a master nunchucker in under a week. Instead, build the skills that result in the highest survival rates. Based on the 27 known winners from the movies and books, 11 of them won primarily because of their passive survival skills. Most of them, again, by not starving to death. This makes your first stop on the circuit edible plants and insects, as well as fire starting. Really sexy skills, I know. Well, we'll see who has the last laugh when you're not dying on poison berries. Also, among the 11 survivalist victors, several won by hiding for most or all of their game. So camouflage, ropes courses, and tree climbing are also top priorities, giving you both offensive and defensive tactical advantages. And speaking of offense, let's talk weaponry. Let's assume you're a quick study and you got all those other skills under your belt. The other major statistical advantage comes from studying blades. Of the 27 known victors, an astounding 8 of them won thanks to their use of blades. That's almost 30% of the total, whether it was knives or even swords. Realistically, you're not going to become a swordsman in a week, so learning to use a regular knife is going to be your best bet. On top of being the victor's choice of weapon, it also statistically is the most likely weapon to appear in the game. There are 25 known weapons that have appeared in the cornucopia across the two Hunger Games we see on screen. If you specialize in any other weapon, like, come on, slingshot? Scythe? You have a 1 in 25 chance of running across that weapon, but the cornucopia has housed three different types of knife blades, single-sided knives, daggers, and throwing knives. Choose to specialize in knives, and you've just tripled your chances that any weapon you come across will be a weapon that you can use. Sure, you may find a dagger instead of a throwing knife, but any blade that you have will serve roughly the same purpose, namely, killing other children. Uh... Yay? But since they're also so versatile, other tributes will be carrying knives as tools. Meaning that if you come across a dead body, the odds are much higher that they're going to be carrying a knife than any other sort of weapon. I mean, honestly, what are you going to do with a trident? Roast three marshmallows at the same time? Knives are also one of the best offensive weapons to use to avoid getting killed by someone else. Five of the 27 winners are known as brutality-based victors, meaning that they fought using brute strength and their raw athleticism. These are usually your careers or just your standard issue psychopaths. Statistically, you want to do everything possible to avoid getting in close to these tributes because they do all their killing melee style. On the other hand, you still need a method for taking them down if you need to. Because the odds are not in your favor for killing them up close, remember me mentioning throwing knives? You can double your knife use to train for throwing knives, giving you a weapon that can be used at any distance, whether you're throwing from 20 feet away or just, you know, generally stabbing. <laughs> The last word of warning here is that you need to make sure that you're not reducing your odds. Avoid wrestling, weightlifting, and heavy weapon training like axes. These are going to build your bulky muscles, which won't give you a statistical advantage, but will increase your metabolism. So you end up burning more calories when you reach the arena, reducing your time to starvation. And that's it. Your time has arrived. You're well-trained, ready to get into the arena, right? You're going to grab the last of those capital cream puffs, run into the arena, grab your knives, stab everyone, and then spend your day on Victor's Row in abject guilt and isolation. Truly, a winner is you. Well, if you're gonna live to see that day happen, you'll need to survive the first 10 minutes of the games, which we all know are the deadliest. So you've just come up the pipe, the clock is ticking down, and you're faced with one of the game's most important decisions. Do you run into the cornucopia or not? If you're unprepared, you have 10 seconds to make that decision. But lucky for you, you've watched this video and know the right answer. Heck no! Statistically, it makes zero sense. In the 70 
24th games, 11 out of the 24 tributes died at the cornucopia. In the next year's quarter quell, 8 out of 24 die. That's an average 40% death rate, which immediately says that if you don't get involved in the cornucopia, your probability of winning instantly doubles, going from 1 in 24 odds to almost 1 in 10. That's huge! Sure, there may be a major weapon stash there, but the hand-to-hand -hand athletes in the careers have a huge statistical margin here. Of the cornucopia deaths across two movies, almost 85% of the kills were committed in close quarters by careers. They're not starved, they're working at close range, and they're hyped on adrenaline. So it's literally the worst time to engage those guys. Yes, this significantly decreases your likelihood of picking up a weapon right off the bat, but for the first several days of the arena, lack of weapons doesn't matter. Your priorities in the game are the same as your training priorities. Survival first. In an ideal scenario, you want to pick off a supply bag, box, satchel, whatever, from a totally unoccupied corner of the cornucopia. It's definitely possible because we've seen it done twice in the first movie. You're not going to interact with another tribute while doing this, and seriously, if it looks like it's a contest, it's statistically better to abort than fight it out. So play it safe, stay alive, and run away. And with that, congratulations. You've successfully lived past the deadliest 10 minutes of the games. You're now a well-nourished survivalist ready to outlast the other frightened children. But seriously, what do you do now? Where do you go? Do you stalk other tributes, or do you run for cover? Should you build an alliance, or go with solo? Are tracker jackers edible? And most importantly of all, what is the one almost foolproof strategy that will guarantee you survive far longer than anything else you could possibly do in the games? Longer than anything we've discussed today. Well, Katniss, put an arrow through that subscribe button to make sure that you're notified next Next week when that video gets published. And in the meantime, climb a tree and hang tight with this theory all about how the beast gets royally screwed over in Beauty and the Beast. And hey, remember, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut.